Okay, hello. Um, if we're expecting everybody to come over and stuff, we're never going to start. So we'd rather start now. And whoever is here, they're going to hear what we're saying. It's not good. All right. So this time. I expected that it's going to be a lot of familiar faces, and there is one, two, three, four, five people here for the first time. That's pretty good, right? So, anyways, I have to say what we have to say. You know, this is Dark and Music Talks, and eventually this connecting people that know stuff about related with music one way or another with people that want to learn about stuff, and we're here. As you see, we're going as informal as possible, so we can have a nice discussion and record everything with good sound and good video for everybody around the world to see. So we had quite a lot of people from all over the world send me messages and, and comments that, oh, watch the videos, you know, and it was really nice. So what we do has a, a global character, let's say. And this is happening in five more countries. Actually, tomorrow, this time, I'll be in Barcelona for the first discussion. And I'm not going to sleep, am I? So, eventually, I'll be flying. So, yeah, this is your stage, right? The only thing I want you to do is get the microphone when, when you have something to say so we can record everything on cameras and we have nice quality media, right? This is about music entrepreneurship. There is people from classical music trying to get new ideas. There's people that want to get tactics for what they do already, there's more established people, or promoters or vocal coaches or whatever. Everybody wants to learn something new. So let's do this. Thanks a lot for, for being here. I'll, I'll get your feedback from for the venue. This is a new one. I like it really much. Two pound beer if you want. At any time just go there and pick it up. And this is Paul. I think we have to uh, thanks a lot, like ninety million yard for giving us this space. And now I think it's time for the speaker, isn't it? Hello, me. So let's start. You away. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. So does that work? Let me see if it works. Yeah. So Tony asked me to actually say that if you want to uh, say something on Twitter, you should use the hashtag Darker Music Talks. You can see there. The screen is not big. My head is actually much bigger than the screen. So I don't know if it says anything about me or not. Uh, my name is Paul. Uh, I've called this talk music but was my first love because I'm no musician, you don't understand why I'm better. Uh, so I, I'm going to start by backtracking, uh, not talk about music first. Uh, I'm, I'm someone who works in technology and digital, I've been doing that for 20 years. Uh, 15, 15 years in mobile, with a parenthesis in here I was a lobbyist as well. So I know how uh, deals are, are being brokered. A lot of people like to say that, you know, sometimes when they introduce me, I've been speaking on stage for like maybe now eight years, they like to say I'm a futurist and I think I am not a what he can be one. So when of course uh, Tommy sent the email that says, uh, well, I'm going to talk about the future of music, I was like, wow, yeah, well, what I'm going to say about the future of music. So I'm going to do it in three acts. I'm first going to talk not about especially music, but where all this is going according to May. And you'll see there's, I'm not a futurist when I'm going to say that. And then we're going to move in more and more towards music to reach a conclusion uh, very close to what uh, Tommy is doing with uh, uh, music entrepreneurship. So my thing keeps moving. I'm sorry, I'm using an iPhone to actually not to read my emails, my tweets, to actually control that thing. First, uh, why is nobody a futurist? Because a lot of people say a lot of crap when they talk about the future. Here's one. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is of no value. That's Western Union in 1836. Uh, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. That's the uh, chairman of IBM uh, more than 50 years ago. There is no reason for any individu individual to have a computer of his own. Uh, that was uh, someone very smart, actually, the uh, founder of DEC, which was a very major, large technological company in the 70s. And why one for you guys? We don't like their sound, and their guitar music is on the way out. Uh, that's Decca Records when they refused to sign the Beatles in 1962. So we all make these kind of mistakes, right? And we all want to believe that we know the future, but we don't. And actually, if you read science fiction, in 2000, we would have had flying cars, but no internet. 
So this is why this is a futile exercise to try to see where we're going. What I'm going to do is a slightly bit, a slightly different. Actually, another guy very smart. Some people hate it, but I see a lot of computers uh, here that do that have the logo on top. Uh, you cannot connect without uh, looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards, and that's obviously Steve Jobs. That was in 2005, investment at Stanford. What I do, I travel a lot. Actually, all of these places, I live in a few. I've lived in Tokyo, I lived in Manila as well, and now I live in London. I was born in Switzerland, as my last name says, I'm Greek. My mother was from Finland. Uh, so a bit from all over the place. I also live in Cyprus because I wanted the sun to see. And as you can see, you know, uh, as a Greek, I can hide my money. I, uh, I dodge the taxes in the Swiss, I can hide the money. It's pretty, pretty cool, actually. Uh, I, I shouldn't say that now that I live in London. They're going to grab me and the next time I cross the border. Uh, but when I do, I travel a lot to actually understand, and I meet a lot of startups and these companies to understand how innovation is happening, and I try to help them at, uh, as, as well achieve uh, disruptions with it. So basically, how can you survive? Because they all want to know the future. You know, any company, any music labels, any major recording uh, companies, they want to understand what is going on because it's the only way they think they're gonna they're gonna um, survive. This is why they hire people like me, and sometimes uh, I can be very dumb when I talk to them. Hope not today. It's going yes. So first, a little bit of uh, about the internet because a lot of people we only talk about internet when we talk about music entrepreneurship. I had a startup back in 2000. As you can see, there was almost nobody on the internet, and now we're reaching basically by the end of the decade, we'll have probably most of the people will be online. Uh, it's five, five to six to seven billion, depending on who, on who you, uh, who you, um, which source you uh, you create for. I mean, this is the ITU which I work for. Facebook, you all know, one and one billion users. YouTube, which is actually the most, the biggest music site in the world, and not anyone else, is more than a billion uniques a month. What does it mean a billion uniques a month? Is a billion people watch a video every month, at least, at least one billion people watch a video every month. This is a kind of reach that has never existed in the history of mankind. I know I sound very important when I say that, but it actually is. And the other thing, I don't know if I don't know if any of you watches movies. I'm not a big fan of some of the Hollywood blockbusters with things from, you know, Harry Potter or the X-Men. What happened back 10 years ago, uh, and I'm only talking about 10 years ago, it used to be that most money was made in the US and almost no money was made outside of the US. And this has completely changed now with new movies, and I mentioned the X-Men or whichever you want to pick just your, your, your worst disease that, they were, that were released. These movies actually make more than 80% of their money outside. The analogy here is the same. The same happens with the reach. You see, I've, I've chosen just four, four companies: Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and Microsoft. Most of their reach is now outside of the U.S., meaning that the U.S. it's not a, a U.S.-centric internet anymore, and it's not even like a Western uh, internet-centric anymore. This number shows it. This is just I've used GDP. I've used all the numbers. I don't want to bore you. and sound like an old professor for those who've been in university or like an English teacher, but. Basically, what you see here is that the West used to rule the world, and basically around 2000, oops, sorry guys, about here, so about where we are, it's actually reversing, and basically in the next five years, the West will actually be lagging behind and not ruling the world anymore in terms of GDP. It's more complex than that. I say, again, you rule the world, it's too easy, but what I'm trying to show you here is that there's a big change. The other thing, the other change that has happened is you all have a mobile phone in your pocket. Every time there was a few major platform shift in terms of technology. There were mainframe computers, mini computers, PCs, the web, and we entered the mobile era. Uh, I, I won't bore you too much about that, but what you have to see is this. I couldn't make it because it's a very square uh, a screen, but it's a logarithmic scale. If you were to see that in an actual scale, the, the 10 billion will be at least 100 times bigger and will be on the top, on the very top of, of this building. Trying to, I'm trying to say here, that it has never been as much computing power in the world uh, since uh, this era of, of mobile that we've entered. Another way to look at that, uh, that's, uh, that's a very funny way because this, right now, that's I think 2013, these numbers. There are, uh, you can see, if you read the numbers yourself, and I'm going to go through a few of them. There are four, uh, 400 million newspapers basically circulated on, in the world. Uh, there's a, oh, less than a 2 billion actually email accounts. There is almost 2 billion internet users, and now the fun numbers. We want to go there is because your music there are four billion FM radio receivers and well there's already more than seven billion uh, mobile fo mobile phone subscribers in the world. 
What I'm trying to say here is the scale of this, this thing, and you'll see why it's important, is actually uh, reaching a point that is uh, uh, un unprecedented in, the, in, in any uh, history, uh, history book, sorry. Of course, why? Because all these stuff you used to have, I mean, I'm old enough to used to have all of these, uh, but they all, of course, they all disappeared, they all merged into a single component. I mean, some of you might still have, of course, a camera, I have a big camera, I see here one is actually filming me, and it's not two guys actually filming me. It's it's not an iPhone yet or an Android. I'm not really, I have no religion when it comes to technology. But what I'm trying to say is that everything has been centered in such a device. Actually, this device, this is an iPhone 5, is more powerful than uh, a computer from three years ago, and this device also has more computing power than the entire humanity in 1945. Yeah, I'm not kidding. You could actually, this is more powerful than the, the guys we were using to go to the moon with a space station. So, yeah, and we watch cats with it, obviously. <laughs> it's not bad. Uh, so, we're moving to a world of a lot of smartphones. Interesting, the only point I, I want you to take away here is that a lot of people, because I said before, there were not, not a lot of people had uh, uh, access to the internet, more have. The West is being disrupted by emerging markets. And basically, uh, more than a billion people, the only ever experience they will have had with a computer, with digital, will be through this. They will never have seen a computer. They will never have seen a desktop computer. They will never have seen a keyboard and a mouse. They will be just this. That will be their, their first experience. And by the way, your kids will have probably a very similar experience. Another thing, uh, automation. You know, you, you talk to your ATM, your ATM is a computer. Basically, you know what was a computer 50 years ago? A computer 50 years ago, it could be 100 years ago, was you and me. We are computers. There's no difference between a computer and us. It's just the amount of stuff we can do in a single second has just risen and risen and risen. And you created ATMs. And I was, I said exoskeleton, I put that picture I took in Tokyo a few years ago. Why? Because uh, we're moving into, uh, into a, uh, an era where actually computing is becoming more and more, way more powerful than humans for a lot of stuff. When I was living in Tokyo in 2008, the government had ordered, you know, they have like an uh, aging population, a lot of people getting, uh, getting old. They ordered more than 30,000 exoskeletons, so basically if you think about Robocop, the stuff that you put on you that to help actually elderly people to, to actually uh, move, transport, and move themselves uh, even in the subway. So they're actually already doing that. It's not science fiction, just what I'm telling you is it's not, not a future, so looking at the stuff that already happens. Uh, there was a very, if you, if you love science fiction, there was this author called uh, William Gibson who says, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Um, we had no flying cars, I said before, but you know what? We have self-driven cars. Well, uh, another, another stuff that's happening is the amount of information. And this is something you must see. I don't know how many emails you guys get per day. I get way too many. How many? Then you have the tweets and the Facebook likes and everything. These are the numbers in one single year. That's one twenty, twenty uh, sorry, 2012. Uh, there were 50 million new books uh, uh, in 2012, and you know that the average readership for a book in the U.S. is 400, 400 people. Only 400 people read a new book that is released. So there's 50 million books released, 2 million new websites, and that's in one single year. And then you know, 48 billion, uh, million hour, billion of new hours YouTube, that's the number of tweets. I, I won't read the numbers, the number of pictures being shared every year, the number of Facebook likes, whatever that means. I, I cannot even read the number because I don't know how to pronounce it, actually. Uh, pardon my French, my uh, uh, English is not my mother tongue, as you can actually realize. Then the Google searches are even bigger, and that's the number of SMS being exchanged in the world. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd better be just reading the number of zeros that they actually try to say what number that is, because we have a trillion or they get zillion or something. <laughs> Meaning, oh, they have an email, it's even worse actually, I forgot about it. Meaning we have a problem, and there's this guy who said, I love that, the acceleration of information has reached a point where it's totally out of control, and nobody can stop it. And this is what we expect. There's so much information. The only way music is information, and there's a lot of noise. One of the reasons people do not listen maybe to music as much as they used to, or a different kind of music, is that because the choice has been risen to, a, to a, uh, a such a level that you have the same, the similar, the same song 50 years ago would have risen through the through the noise. The signal would have risen through the noise, and not anymore. And what I, I'm interested in here is are the dynamics. It's, okay, I said a lot of the stuff and numbers and you know these you know funny anecdotes, but what are the dynamics behind it? First, it's technology disappears for two reasons. First, it disappears. 
When was the last time you actually looked at your oven and you said, wow, I have an oven and it's so cool? No, you don't. You might do that with your phone, but you don't. The only time I actually look at my microwave or my oven uh, is because twice a year I have to figure out how to change a freaking clock. Because I don't know how to, to spring forward on it. But basically that's one of the reasons technology disappears. It goes into the, the, the background. So it doesn't disappear, but you just don't see it anymore. It doesn't mean that it doesn't innovate. It means that it just disappears. And the other, it's, it gets disrupted. Uh, the, I just said before, all these devices, all these stuff become one device. Not too much theory, basically uh, what it is, it's deflation. Deflation means price fall, fall, right? So the price of something that was too expensive to make at some point becomes way less expensive to do at, another, uh, 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 at a more future point. And this is the only reason innovation happens. Uh, is it not working? You want me to do that? I don't know. I think I have a very loud voice. You tell me if I, if I speak too, 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 too loud. People tell me. In the in the in the tube because I, I, when I was living in Tokyo, in Tokyo it's forbidden to actually talk or answer your phone in the tube. Obviously, well, they call that the metro. And when I came here, I realized that oh, everything can go. So now I'm a very bad American. I'm not American, but they think I am. Uh, so deflation, not going to do. Basically, what happens is that the very good example for you guys working in music, you had DLP. DLP was one way to deliver music. That was. Uh, 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 overtaken by the CD, which in, in itself then was overtaken, overtaken by uh, digital downloads. I'm going to go there when I'm going to talk about music specifically in a few uh, in a few moments. But the, the, the key part is, is basically the price of what allows you to transfer music to one point or another has been falling, and it's actually less expensive to put and create music on it on this. Whereas if you were looking at 30 years ago, it would have been much more expensive. Digital technology obviously already existed 40 years ago, which is like was too expensive for the consumer to actually get one in its pocket. That's all it is, right? The only thing that happened, the, the only big change that has happened is that it's going faster. If you want a good example to think, and again, you have to be old enough, I'm only 38, I'm not that old, but you know, I, I remember my dad had an A track in his, in, his, in his car, and then of course he had LPs, and then uh, LPs and EPs, and then CDs. And if you think, don't be nostalgic about the type of, of format, but if you think about the length of each of these formats, it was more, more it gets reduced. The lifespan of an LP in terms of, in the, in the, in the industry, was much longer than uh, and the mixtape, so the, the cassette or the tape, whatever you want to call it, was much longer than the CD, than the digital download. There was, there's a compression of uh, innovation. It goes much faster, which is why and I'm going to go there when I'm talking about music. This is why companies have a hard time actually, uh, you know, people first, companies and people do not like change, but then change happens so fast, they have a hard time figuring out, okay, what do we have to do? And by the time they try to figure it out, the new technology or the new innovation has already entered the market and they're struggling again. And this is something that I'm going to abort when we talk about music. The other, the other thing that, uh, that happens is that there's more and more on-demand computing. I mentioned before a startup in the 90s that I had. Well, if you had a startup in the 90s or any kind of technology, or even if you were doing music, you had to invest so much more to achieve the same result because it was not possible to actually, for me, it was investing in servers. I didn't know if I were to have any single customer, but I had to buy all the servers already in case I would have customers. So you, I would actually pay upfront a lot, of, a, a lot of stuff. The same thing was happening with Creation, creativity, not only music, but also writing. Can, can you try to take this away from this to see if it's I think if it, this is the. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I'll try. But it's, it's off actually, there's no it's flight mode, so I don't. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so basically, uh, so yeah, so, and, and now you, you can actually avoid that. Uh, now you can actually have on demand, I uh, said so computing here for the example, but everything, I mean, you can think about SoundCloud. Uh, all these tools that allow you to directly access and, and, and um, um, access and distribute music, content, whatever kind of information, not only faster and easier, but also such a simply cheaper. And this is something that has changed all the industries. First and foremost, the content industry, in which, of course, music is part for, but all the industries. Uh, and on demand human capital as well. I know I sound like a very old-fashioned capitalistic when I say that, or Marxist, whatever you want to call it, but what I'm saying, trying to say here, is that in a lot of people, I'm a freelancer, I mean, I have a company, obviously, but it's my company, I work, there's more and more people working this way, and I'll come to that in a second as well. 
a little bit of the game, I don't know if you can read it, but that's also to show how fast adoption is going. This is the number of years that a technology was, uh, it took for technology to get adopted by a quarter of Americans, I chose this number, sorry, because it didn't have any other, uh, so I chose the US, to, to get adopted in the country. So can you figure out in 1970, what was the, 40, the 46 years? What took 46 years to get adopted by Americans? And we're talking about, I don't know, 150 years ago. Television? Anyone else? What do you hear? TV? Oh, electricity, simply. Okay. Yeah. So it took 46 years to have a quarter of Americans have access to electricity. Then it took 35 years to have access to the telephone. Somebody can guess the 31. Television. Television. It's radio first. <laughs> then it's actually television. It took 26 years for television to get adopted by a quarter of Americans. Of course, the number of Americans grew, but still, that's the number that's relevant. 16 years is a PC. 13 years is the cell phone, but not the smartphone, the cell phone in general. And seven years is the web. And right now, this number, if I were to actually uh, try to uh, map this number with uh, tools like WhatsApp, it will be even much faster. But basically, what you try to understand, what you see here, it just gets much, much, much faster. That's just exactly, this is why a lot of people, especially companies, but more, they're more slow moving than people are uh, struggling. I will not do that because I just basically just said it. So, what is the impact? Uh, what is the impact, I mean, I mentioned all this, what is the impact on us, and what is the impact, especially on society? Uh, I'm going to be a bit gloomy for a little bit. Uh, when you think about YouTube, I just mentioned that YouTube has a billion uniques, a billion people watching a piece of content on YouTube every month. You talk, I don't know if you've ever talked to a TV executive, I have, they still say, oh, whatever, it's YouTube. You're like, guys, we're talking about a billion people watching a content and you're saying it's not valid? This is exactly the type of problem uh, all incumbents have. They don't understand how fast this is going. What it means as well is that all this digitalization, whatever digitization, whatever you want to call it, of content creates a crash. The crash is the crash of retail. There, there's a reason I'm going to say that. So basically, when you want to buy stuff, more and more often than not, you do it online, which is great. I do that. I'm on Amazon every day ordering stuff. It's just easier, right? And I can do it even from my phone while I'm on the train. The overground took, uh, was uh, going at half the speed today because of issues. I took like two hours to come here. So I have a lot of stuff to, to buy. My wife will actually kill me. Uh, but what I'm trying to say here is that the physical framing is crashing under information. So the, the, everything that is physical, it still exists. You still buy stuff. But you needed to have a lot of, uh, of, of uh, logistics that were also physical that actually don't have to be anymore. And you'll see why that matters uh, in, in, a, in a minute. But that's the worst. That's a cr the crash of jobs. I don't know if any one of you here is high to hire, they work as freelancers. Uh, but Greece, I'm Greek, so of course I can say that. The number of youth unemployment is 57%. In Spain, it's a little bit down. These are numbers from last month. It's 54% uh, of youth unemployment. Then you have to add underemployment, because a lot of people do not track underemployment, which means people that actually don't make enough of a living. I'm not talking about poverty. Mm -hmm. Could be just you work at half time because there's actually no jobs. If you have this number, basically a lot of people don't have jobs. And then I only talked about Greece and Spain, but these are numbers that are trackable in most of, of, of the Western world, and even obviously in emerging markets, where there are not enough jobs being created by the number of people that actually want to have a job. By the way, in the next 10 years, a billion women will enter the workforce and there will never be a billion, actually, jobs being created. Not that I'm saying that women shouldn't have new jobs, they will, we're, we're having a crush. There's not enough jobs uh, being created for, uh, for all the people that want to enter the workplace. And again, if you think about what I said before about the West versus the, 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 the emerging market, and I call it the West because it's just easier, it, we, had it, we had it easy, basically, because, you know, it was like, oh, we, got, we have it all, and then, you know, suddenly, oh, the rest, the rest of the world is waking up, oh, the rest of the world is actually working, oh, they do stuff pretty good, actually, oh, and, you know, it's just, it's just the same thing as I said about, you know, a lot of stuff became, became a phone, it's the same, exactly the same dynamic, suddenly the, the, the division of labor means that these other countries ought to do stuff as well, as well, if not better as we do, and we don't have it as good as we used to, and there's not enough jobs. A 16, year, a 16 year old today will have 36 jobs in his life. I mean, when, if I say that to my dad, I'm like, oh, my, God, my dad is 81. So, of course, I don't want him to have a heart attack. But he's like, oh, wow, he's already enough. You know, the only, he doesn't understand what I do. My, my dad is a doctor. 
was a doctor. The only question he asks me every month is, Paul, do you have enough money? Okay, well, so, but if I were to tell him that I was to change the job every, like 36 times in my life, I'm not 16 anymore, but if I were to tell him that, they would not understand. What I'm trying to say here is that there will be, and this is not being resolved, it's not going to be suddenly a huge, fantastic uh, amount of jobs being created. There are ways, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, and the other thing I mentioned before, exoskeleton in ATMs, there's 47%, basically half of this room, if you're were employed, half of your job, because they're existing, half of your jobs will be just gone in 20 years. It will just do not exist anymore because they were replaced by computers, by processes. If you have a job that can be may either replicated by a computer, or if you have a job that you can divide of in small parts that can be done by a computer, these jobs will certainly disappear. And so half of those uh, will, be, uh, will have disappeared in 20 years. Come to a minute, or the other jobs that will be created, but this just is, so the job framing is crashing under information, the same, 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 same idea. Other, and that goes in the same direction is the crash of the middle class. The middle class was, you know, there was this myth that the middle class was holding societies together. It's because we have a middle class that societies exist. It's, it's a buffer be, be, uh, between people that are poor or extremely poor and uh, very rich. And this middle class was society. It was the whole point of uh, liberal democracies was actually to empower the middle class. The middle class is actually disappearing also as well in, in a lot of countries. The owners of capital gather more and more income. Again, I don't want to sound like an, an anti-capitalist, you will see why, but there are, uh, if you have capital, it grabs more, more capital. There's a rise, it's not, you know, you've probably heard that in the US, a rise of the 1%, but it's... A, you, you want to try not to use a microphone, let's say? I can use it without. You're loud enough. You yeah, know, I know, so, so for you, you guys. If you hear me well, I can do that without. Each, That's right. Take it. And, uh, yeah, it's a bit like this, like a bee in my, in my mouth. And the rise is not of the 1%, it's of the 0.1%. 0, 0, 0 and the rise of luxury. There's a reason why, versus Apple, it, is, it, is it for you a luxury product? No. You can associate that with a luxury product? Yes, no? Technically, yes. Technically, yes. I'll come to you a little bit later about what is luxury, but there's a reason why Apple has just hired two key people. One, she, she, they hired a woman, she used to run uh, Burberry, the retail part of Burberry, and she just became the head of retail for Apple, because Apple has understood that the growth and um, about what is going to grow in the next, because I told you, you know, not, you know, crash of job, crash of middle class, so people do not do buy stuff. They will, will be in the luxury segment. The same things, they hire also an, an, an ex of LVMH, uh, Louis Vuitton, Mobile and, and, and Hennessy. We're not sure about what exactly he does, but their chances is actually designing or helping design whatever, watch whatever they, they're making. So they're moving into a segment is luxury. I'm saying that, I know you probably don't care about Apple and luxury, but there's a reason to say that, because that's tied in with, with music. So luxur luxury is actually as well rising. It's a crush of retail before the crush of the rise of, of luxury. And the GDP, basically it's flat. Uh, you can vote whoever you want. Of course, we'll have bumps. I'm not saying that it will be in a, in, a, in a crush the rest of our lives. What I'm trying to say is on the on the on the on the uh, on the next on, on on average GDP will have a very small growth. These kind of growth we said okay because again liberal democracies are type of societies that built upon an engine of growth that gives power to the middle class. The middle class buys stuff, and then people can have jobs. People buy stuff. This is slowly, sorry, uh, eroding. Again, nothing happens tomorrow. I'm trying to tell you we have a trend so that you understand where we're going. So, what, what is that? It means that first, I just mentioned a lot of stuff that's crashing, so you don't trust the government. More and more people do not trust the government. Not trust in terms of, oh, they're cheating on us. But just like, it used to be that the government was one of the key fa uh, factor to actually make the society run. And by that, I mean, you have a job and a problem. Government cannot provide jobs anymore. I'm not talking about the UK for government here. I, I, I cannot vote in the UK, so I'm not even like trying. Any type of government, there's a less and less trust in the government. There's less and less trust in schools and in the education system as well, because it used to be, my father thought like that, he said, Paul, you'll have to be university, and if you have if you have a diploma, 
you'll be set for life. Well, no, it doesn't happen like that anymore. You have so many people, and again, I'm normally talking about emerging markets, you have so many people that do not have a job, even where they're, oh, we use, we use that term, overqualified. It just doesn't happen. So what, what happens there is that institutions, in general, you don't believe them anymore. I don't believe them anymore. You don't trust them anymore. So you want to find other ways to replace that. And this is the one the key thing that is happening, this shift. Of course, then also there are cheap people are cheating. We heard about the NSA, so with Edward Snowden, and the revelation about the wrongdoing of the government. It's not only that, it's the whole, the whole engine that was supposed to make people have a better life that is kind of uh, gripped. So, no jobs, no growth, no institutions, so what I'm telling you, there's no future? No, it's obviously not, it's not on train. What I'm going to try to do is untangle all of this to make a little bit of a map. I believe in, a, in maps. I use, I could have used the district line where I live on, but this doesn't make sense to me. I used the Ginza line when it was in Tokyo. This is not a real map. You know, we see that and we see that's a map. What I like about the concept of maps is that this is obviously this is just you know, a representation of reality. And if I take a, this, you know, took this line and actually apply the, actual, the real Tokyo, this is the actual, you know, the, this, is a, this is what the, is an analogy to try to uh, tell you that here I'm not telling you where we're going to go. I don't know if you're going to go up, going to go down. I'm going to, what I try to understand, and I don't have the, key, the, the answers to it all, but I try to understand when I work with companies and with startups, is not tell them, okay, this will happen in 20 years. It's to see the pattern in the compass. I believe that we, we, we have to have maps as people, but we should live our life by compass. And say, okay, we have a map, but we never exactly know where it is. But, uh, but in, your, in our minds, a map of the subway is a good way to actually represent it. It's not a reality, again, it's a straight line, but it's a good way to represent how, where it goes. So first, let me know if there's something gloomy, the good stuff. Networks enabled openness, transparency, and trust. I know a lot, when I say this sentence, a lot of people are like, yeah, whatever. Facebook is spying on us, Google is spying on us, US government is spying on us, UK government is spying on us. So I, yes. But if you were to tell anyone 20 years ago, and I'm not talking 50, but 20 years ago, that it would be okay to share so many things online on Facebook with perfect strangers, they will call you a fool and put you in a nest alone. We are learning by doing, it's not perfect, but we're learning how to the trust strangers, basically, and how to create a new field of community that didn't exist. We're creating basically some kind of a city. The internet is becoming a city. So you don't know everyone, but you can meet other people, you can meet other trades, you can meet other um, experts, you can meet other type of values, but this is how we're learning. It's slow. Some people are ahead of the curve. I'm always thinking that creatives are usually ahead of the curve because they had to create this type of grouping before uh, even the existence of the internet because it was a different type of living. It was not a typical career when you, know, you just go a nine to five job. So this is something the internet is creating. We know obviously that the institutions cannot provide anymore. This was what I told, told you beforehand. So we try to substitute for the institutions. I mean, one of the proof is here, we know. What do we do here? We, we're having these discussions, and Tommy has created this, this uh, musicpreneur uh, movement, this darker music talks. It's, it's a part of the process to talk, to try to understand, and I'm not the best guy, of course, as I told you before, to understand, to keep maybe trends in music, but to try to understand where we're going. And this is exactly the type of things that happens more and more. Trust me, I've been, I've been traveling around the world, and I'm lucky, I'm not saying that to brag, for six years, and in every city I go to, I see the same type of movement happening. This was something that back in you know, the early 2000s, when I, the, the, other, the startup I was mentioning before, when I was in that startup, it wasn't happening as much. It was to some extent, but now I see people coalescing to, together around interests, around passions, around trade, in a way that has never happened before. The same, the same way I said there was a billion people, or more than a billion people on Facebook, and it's not Facebook, I don't care if Facebook is going to survive or not, unless some companies care, but I do not. The ID is going to sustain itself and survive. So we fight protect, protect, protectionism, is it? We, you know, we realize the institution does not work, so we try to provide for ourselves, and this is why we fight protectionism. Suddenly we say, why is this institution blocking my way. I want to do this. I want to create music. I want to be able to do that. Why are these institutions in front of me blocking my way? The more and more it happens. It happens actually a lot. And basically what we do, we look for meaning. 
We are, the generation that is coming up is a generation, and I'm, I hate the term generation because, you know, they always like, it's very easy to put people in the bucket and say, oh, if you're 18 to 40, this is your generation. It doesn't happen like that. It's a bit more complicated. It's basic, but in the basic ID, the, the, look, the meaning as a, in information will have more and more importance. The, for jobs, the answer, of course, the on-demand jobs, they already, uh, networks allow you to do that, OJS, ELANs, other networks, like, you know, I want to create, I needed to create um, uh, an application for, for, for a phone, uh, for a client. I found people in Poland, they did that. I never had met the people. I just, you know, check the credentials, check reviews from other people. I know it's a bit, it sounds a bit dry, it's like looking for a review on Amazon about a book, and say it's the same thing about people. Again, it's a work in progress, but the idea is there. You can actually tap into and work, collaborate, and, and create communities with people that are very much afar from you. So that's why you have the rise of the freelancers, but I just mentioned the rise of the entrepreneurs. Some of you are, in a way, part of the startups, obviously. I mean, we over here about startups these days. They always existed, but there's, there's a reason why. And the rise of networks, again, the fact that you can create uh, community. So these are, this is a way to actually, this is where jobs will actually come from. 